and he dropped to his knees and he was like six foot four, so was my husband. All of a sudden we're on our knees together. When the chains hit the floor of that prison, I just was like, this is what Easter's about. It's about people that are in chains, but they're getting set free. I'm Paul Hastings and you're listening to Compelled, real people telling true stories of God's compelling love working in their lives. We're starting the first week of our podcast by releasing three episodes right now, all at once, to give you a taste of what's to come. I'll tell you more about Compelled and share a sneak preview of our next episode right after our story. But for now, I hope that you're encouraged by the story of Linda Strom, a woman who's brought the light of Jesus into prisons and specifically to death row inmates for over 30 years. God has used Linda and her ministry, Discipleship Unlimited, to touch the lives of countless prisoners. This is the story of Linda Strom. Linda, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Compelled. Can you describe for us your life growing up and then how you came to Christ? So my whole childhood was very uh, similar to the women that I work with today. I do work in prisons, and I work with women that come from very dysfunctional and many times abusive backgrounds. My father was physically abusive. Um, my mother was verbally abusive. And at the age of 17, I found myself uh, in a relationship with a young man I met who rode a motorcycle and was kind of like Fonzie. And um, I ended up pregnant at Mm. 17 years of age, ended up getting married on the day after Christmas when I was 17, and had a son, and that marriage didn't last very long. At the age of 19, I was separated from my son. He was left with his grandparents, and I moved to Minneapolis, and I wondered where was God. I was looking uh, for the God of my grandmother. She would always be saying scripture to us or singing hymns. It was like, you could depend on my grandma to give you a word of hope. And one of her favorite verses is, with God, all things are possible. And she explained to me that she would be praying for me every every night, every morning, and that God was going to be greater than what I was going through at that time. And at 19, I met another man that would become my husband. It was at that point in my life, separated from my son in a second marriage. Neither one of us were Christ followers at that time that I thought, I'm repeating the pattern of my parents. I knew it, but I didn't know what to do because my mom had been divorced and married many times, and so had my dad. And here I was at 20 years of age in a second marriage, and it was going nowhere, separated from my son. And I remember getting on my knees that night, and um, the reason I was on my knees is I'd thrown a pot of beans at my husband. It wasn't like I was so spiritual, but I had to clean him up. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. (laughs) So I'm on my knees, and I'm saying, God, if there is a God, and if you're real, you got to help me, because if you're not real, I'm not going to make it in this world. Hmm. And uh, I was I was broken. And that night, as I cried out to God, um, I stayed home. Billy Graham was on TV, and he was speaking on marriage. That's how good God is. And I can't tell you anything he said about marriage that night, Paul. The only thing I can tell you was that he said, as high as the heavens are above the earth, that's how great God's love is for those who fear him. And I did fear God. That was the reason I was still alive. I mean, I didn't know how to put my life back together, but I remember him talking about the love of God. And I said to God in my apartment with my son away from home, with my husband, who I was married to at 20, thinking he might never come home because I'd gotten angry and thrown beans and maybe he wouldn't come back Mm -hmm. when I wouldn't blame him. Um, That night, as I prayed that prayer and said, please, God, if you're real, please love me like that, Mm. it was like I was baptized in the love of God. And it's been there ever since. It didn't, I mean, I I desperately miss my son. Um, I wanted for my marriage to work, but that wasn't the issue anymore. The, uh, The change that took place in knowing that someone loved me unconditionally, just like I was was just overwhelming for me. Wow. Wow. What did Dallas think? Like, was it, 
you know, apparent right away? Did he come home and say, you know, what, what's going on here? Well, I call this parents because his parents didn't know I was a divorced person. I mean, oh, wow. they didn't know any of our history, but they were praying for me and they connected. I could connect that with my grandma. With And so when I prayed with uh, Billy Graham that night, I called my mother-in-law and I said, I was just watching Billy Graham on TV and I prayed the prayer with him. And she said, stay right where you are. Dad and I'll be right over. And they came over and they started hugging and kissing me and they gave me a Bible and they gave me books to read. And they were ecstatic. Dallas's reaction was totally different. He wasn't impressed, Hmm. but I quit going out and partying after work. I was working for Northwest Airlines at the time. I quit partying. I started cooking for him and just enjoying being with him. And uh, and he saw the change in me, and he ended up driving to Omaha, Nebraska to hear Billy Graham because I thought Billy Graham's the only person that knows this. Mm. And so we lived in Minneapolis. We got in our car. We went to the racetrack in Nebraska in Omaha, and that's where Dr. Graham was. And he didn't say anything to me, but later he told me that on the way home in the car, he prayed to receive the Lord as well. Wow. So that was the beginning of a great adventure. So when I when I prayed and, and I really felt that love, I just could not wait to go back and see Terry because when he was born, I thought I loved him so much and I thought I'm never going to hurt my son like I was hurt. I'll never leave him because my mom had left when I was a teenager and yet I did the very things I said I'd never do. And I went back to see him. And it was like a real healing time for me. And I was able to bring him back to uh, Minneapolis. And I, and I hadn't asked Dallas if I could do that. Mm. And so I didn't know if he'd be at the airport or not, but he was. I, I sent word to him. I didn't call him myself because I was too afraid he would say no. But I, I knew I had to do this. And I was trusting that God would help help us and keep us together. And when I got to the airport, Dallas was there, and he picked up Terry, and that was the beginning of their relationship. But the the amazing part of the story for me is my mother-in-law, because she had no clue that I had a child, because Dallas's family he called it religious, but they really had a relationship with Christ. So he felt like they wouldn't accept me mm. if they knew my story, which really puts pressure on you to be married to somebody whose parents don't really know you. Oh, so wow. we decided we had to go over and tell his mom. And so Dallas called and said, we're coming over for coffee. When we walked in her kitchen, I was holding Terry And she looked at him and she looked at me and she said, he's beautiful and he looks just like you. And she didn't ask me any questions. Um, She just started loving my son. Mm. And it was a beautiful healing Mm. family that God brought me into. She was like, for me, like my Naomi. Uh, She taught me about her God. Mm. And we were together. She died at 94, and she actually spoke at Dallas's funeral, my husband's mm. funeral, when he died. So she was a, a strength to me, just like my grandma. So let's let's step forward a little bit more then. So um, you were now living in Minneapolis with Dallas and Terry, and then how did how did you become involved with the prison ministry? Well, Dallas and I had two more children. The next two Christmases after we became Christian. Oh, wow. So, and then um, we felt like it was going to just be perfect. You know, Terry was going to follow the Lord and our boys were going to follow the Lord. And what happened is we joined Campus Crusade for Christ staff and we moved to Milwaukee. And during that time, Terry went through some serious rebellion and uh, we ended up having my brother, who was a doctor in Kentucky, take Terry for a semester to try to get him out of the environment that we were living with in in Wisconsin. And uh, during that time, uh, Terry got into heavy drug usage. So we went down. My brother was the doctor at Eddyville State Prison. 
and he was also going through Asbury Seminary. My brother and I, once we came to Christ, we both wanted to fix everybody because we knew what it was to be broken. <laughs> yeah. And so we both had this zeal, you know, we're just going to make a difference in the world. And then you realize that only Christ can make a difference in the world, but he wants to use ordinary people. Just like you said in your podcast, it's about ordinary people with an extraordinary God. So yeah. we went down to Eddyville, Kentucky to visit Terry over Easter. And while we were there, my husband and I went over to Eddyville Prison on Easter Sunday to meet a man named Billy Houchins. And Billy had been on death row, but during the 70s when this all took place, there was a moratorium in the death penalty. Mm -hmm. And he wrote his story out, and they sent it to everybody in the prison because he was so radically changed by Christ. And I got to meet him, Dallas and I got to meet him that, on that Easter Sunday with my brother. And he shared his story. And there was such a presence of God in that place. And then the officer said, your time is up. And Billy said, but could we pray? And we would had to stand. There were no chairs in the room. We'd been together for like an hour. And the officer said, yeah, take some time to pray. And he dropped to his knees. And he was like six foot four. So was my husband. All of a sudden, we're on our knees together. When the chains hit the floor of that prison, I just was like, this is what Easter's about. Mm. It's about people that are in chains, but they're getting set free. Mm. And I walked out of that prison. And I said, let's just sell everything. <laughs> and let's just move down here. And we'll start working in the prison. And, and like my husband was married to somebody that's like, you know, I'm emotional. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like Scandinavian. Uh -huh. And he didn't know what to do. So he just kind of would pat me and say, well, we'll pray about that. We'll think about that. We'll talk about that. But, you know, a year went by and we hadn't done anything. And then we got the call in Wisconsin to do a marriage seminar up in the northern part of the state. And while we were doing the marriage seminar, there was a guy who said, our associate warden wants somebody to do marriage uh, seminars for inmates and their wives. Would you two be willing to come and do a day for the wives of inmates? And they'll be able to come and join you. Well, we started doing that, and we did it for 20 years every month in many different prisons in the state of Wisconsin, under the state of Wisconsin. So actually, they paid the ministry for us wow. to come and do this. And then we, we got a center in the inner city um, of Milwaukee, and we'd have big parties when guys would get out of prison for their families. We started doing child evangelism for... Uh, and some of the most wonderful things happen when you're in this. Where Jesus tells us where the action is. He said it's with the homeless, with the naked, with the prisoner. So we would have these parties where um, children would be marching and singing to Jesus, and you have black, white, Hispanic people, and it's, you're just one in Christ. And it was it was a wonderful season. And then Prison Fellowship picked us up. And so they asked if we would be contract speakers for them. And that's how I got to Texas. Now, let's loop back to Terry. So how old was Terry at this point when all of this was going on and you and your husband now were involved in prison ministry? Where was Terry in, at this point in time? Terry was at a point where he was saying he didn't really even know if there was a God. And, uh, and we went through many years where Terry struggled. He wanted to believe, but he had a lot of brokenness. And it was really hard for me because as a believer, I had asked for forgiveness, but I couldn't get rid of the guilt. Hmm. And so I took Terry to a, a counselor to help him because <laughs> I thought, if he gets help, I'll, I'll feel better too. We'll all, be, we'll all be this happy family. So he saw his counselor for about seven times. And then Tom, the counselor, came out and said, it seems like you're the person I need to see. But you, yeah. you, Linda, were the person <laughs> that needed to see. Yes, yeah. Yeah. And so he started talking with me, and I said that one of the things I couldn't get over was that I had been a bad mother. And he said, are you saying your son is bad? And I said, no, I'm not saying that. And he said, you really are. 
He said, you know, you've asked for forgiveness. He's granted you forgiveness. Now you need to surrender him. You need to let go and trust God in his life. Well, that just sounded just crazy to me. My son was 17 using all different kinds of drugs. There wasn't seemed to be anything I could do. We tried some treatment. He ended up leaving the treatment center because he wasn't ready. Hmm. And I needed help. And so um, one night when Terry was late and getting home from work, because he lived with us for quite a while, um, I was really worried about it. And yeah, I was thinking, is he going to be all right tonight? And then I got on my knees and I said, God, please help me to receive the forgiveness that you've given me. I know you forgive me, but I can't get rid of all this guilt. And so I prayed. And as I was uh, praying, I just laid it at the foot of the cross. And I just said, I'm going to stay right here with you until I know in my heart that it's it's gone, hmm. that you paid for that. Even though it's something I regret, uh, there was no way to change it. And that night I got free from that guilt and shame. That is such a beautiful story of God's forgiveness. And thank you for sharing that with us. Up to this point, you've told us a lot about your ministry work that you had done in Wisconsin, but I know that eventually you moved your ministry to Texas. Can you tell us about the first time you went to a prison chapel service in Texas? The very first night I went into the chapel and I ministered to the women. And you could give an altar call in Texas, not in Wisconsin. So I had all these women at the altar just uh, receiving hmm. the love of God. And, and all of a sudden I thought, my life makes sense now. All of the stuff I went through has given hope because God is greater than anything you face, like my grandma said, and he's the God of hope. And when I saw people getting hope, I just, I wanted to do it as long as I had breath in me. Mm. I don't think there's anything that thrills me, like going into a prison and, and watching the Spirit of the Lord move through people that come in that, whether they're broken or, well, we're all broken, but it's out of that brokenness that his light and love just pour out. And he's so, uh, it's so evident that Jesus is there. Yeah. He just shows up for the broken people. You're right. He, he does show up for the broken people. In fact, you've written a book called Carla Faye Tucker Set Free, which is about your friendship with a death row inmate in Texas named Carla Faye Tucker, who would become the first woman executed in Texas in over 100 years. Uh, and certainly she is one of those broken people that you speak of. In the book, though, you don't focus on her crime, but rather the fact that she was a new creation through Christ, that Christ had saved her from her broken state. Can you share with us more about your friendship with her? The first time I met Carla Faye Tucker, and I went over to death row, she said to me, we don't call this death row. We call this life row mm. because the life of the Lord is here. And she didn't want to tell me her story. She wanted to hear my story. She was just alive to the word of God, and she was not afraid about dying. And she really knew she was forgiven. And she had learned to sign, do sign language, because one of our girls on death row was deaf. Hmm. And so she wanted to be able to share the gospel. They became like a little nucleus of uh, all of them were believers at that point. And so um, I saw a radical love for these women that they had for each other and for that God had for them. And they, they were like a little mini church. And um, Carla just had a shepherd's heart. And she was always like wanting them like to show us if they had written something or if they had a, a testimony to give. She was like the person that encouraged everybody else. So there was just a great friendship among the women, and they started praying for people that I was concerned about. And so the, the book, Carla Faye Tucker Set Free, is about people who came there. Like one of the ladies from my Bible study came, and she had AIDS. Mm. And she had gotten that from her husband, who was bisexual. Mm. And she couldn't forgive him. And he was dying, and she was knew that she would be dying. But she was so angry 
and she didn't know where to go with the anger. And I had the girls praying, and then I said, would you like to come, Chris, to prison? She spoke fluent Spanish. I said, you can work with our uh, Spanish-speaking inmates during the time that we have our conference. And it was amazing watching God because she had all of these girls that were struggling with sexual issues, and she was having to guide them through the love of God and through forgiveness. And then she went over to death row, and they prayed for her. And she walked off a death row and said to me, if God can forgive them, and I know he has because I feel his presence there, maybe God can forgive my husband. Mm. And if he can forgive my husband, then I need to forgive him too. And she died that year and asked me to do her funeral. And she said, I want you to tell them that I, I found life and freedom on death row and that we're all on death row and that the women that I met are still alive but I've gone to be with the Lord because I was able to get forgiveness. Mm. And so I begin to see the scripture, a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out as what was happening to people that came to what we called Life Row and saw these women that were murderers lifting up holy hands. They truly were forgiven and they knew they were forgiven. I know that Carla asked you towards the end, she asked you to be her, uh, I'm not sure the exact term, but spiritual advisor. Spiritual advisor, basically in preparation um, for execution. Right. Tell me, what what was it like for you seeing her each day? Like, was that a, a challenge for you each time you would go and see her, just knowing like, wow, you know, I don't know. Yeah. What was that like? You know, someone else asked me that question and and... My answer was, you know, I was her spiritual advisor, but really she was my spiritual advisor hmm. because she was so in love with Jesus. And the warden had been so impacted by Carla that she did everything she could to help her to have the tools that she needed to uh, be ministered to. So she allowed us to hold a prayer vigil, and we were able to tape it for her. Oh, wow. So um, here we have women incarcerated praying for Governor Bush, because uh, he was the governor then, and and praying for God's will, and officers in there too. And it's like, this is not prison. This is freedom. I mean, this is just, it doesn't make sense. None of this makes sense. It was about glorifying Christ. And who doesn't need a spiritual advisor like that? I know God knew I needed that. And of course, that that was what really impacted my son, Terry, when he met her. Mm. I mean, he just felt like he could never get free from drugs. He'd given up hard drugs, but he smoked marijuana every single day. And so when it was when he met Carla, and uh, and that was only because the lead guitarist in his band had overdosed and died. Hmm. And I said, you know, I want you to come to Texas with us. There's just something unique about what's happening in the prison there. The girls would love to meet you. And so he came and he went over and the women on the row prayed for him. They talked to him about freedom and what can happen through Christ. And uh, Terry is set free on death row. The very place God took us was the place he set our son free. It's wow. pretty amazing, isn't it? On death row. Yeah. What a good God. Man. Um, you know, you had um, been working with, with um, Carla for almost 10 years now as their spiritual advisor. And then at one point, finally, there was an execution date that was set. Tell me about, you know, the, the 24 hours leading up to the actual execution for Carla. Well, I had asked Carla what she wanted me to do the night of the execution because the executions actually take place in Huntsville. And uh, she asked me if I would be there for the women on the row. They were all so close and they were hurting so bad. And then also if I would go cell to cell and out into the dorms and tell the women 
that she wasn't afraid. So I did that. I went cell to cell during the day, and I just went in to uh, close custody to any place I could, and I just said, at 6 o'clock today, Carla Faye Tucker is going to be executed. And she wanted, She sent me here with a message, and that message is to tell you that she knows exactly where she's going, she's been forgiven, and she wants you to know that same forgiveness. And if you'd like prayer, uh, that's why we're here. I took a team of people in, and it was just uh, an amazing day. And we would see, I mean, people receiving the Lord all over the prison. And then at 5 o'clock, they opened the chapel, and we had a chapel service. It was so neat because when she got her date, she asked uh, the warden, uh, will you be with me? And Warden Begg had had five children, I believe. And she said, when one of my children's in the emergency room, I'm with them and I'm going to be with you. So when Carla got on the gurney, she asked if the warden could hear her. And this isn't in the transcripts, but what she said was, I'd like to thank Warden Baggett and the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for all the love that they've shown me. You know, the, the state of Texas was so kind and uh, loving towards Carla during that period of time. Nobody really wanted this to happen. It's like the law was in place. You know, isn't that kind of like the scripture? The law is in place and someone has to die. But in our case, Jesus died. The law is in place. We've all broken the law. Yeah. And, and Jesus really took the death penalty for all of us. Yeah. After she thanked the state of Texas, she she thanked Ron Carlson. Ron stood with her the night of the execution. His sister, Deborah, was um, killed by Carla, and he had come to visit Carla when she was at Harris County Jail uh, just because he was so angry. He wanted to get rid of all of the uh, hatred because he couldn't stand to live with that kind of hatred towards someone. And through their their talking, he developed a relationship with the Lord mm. and a friendship with Carla. Mm. And he said to her, I want to stand with your family and friends the night of your execution. And so she thanked Ron for being there. She asked forgiveness for uh, the family of her victim, asked them to please forgive her, and that she prayed that God would give them peace. Mm. And then she just said, I'm going to go and be face-to-face -face with Jesus now, and I'll see you when you get here. And then she started humming it as well with my soul. So... At six, we were still singing, and girls would get up and, and share testimonies or scripture. I had said what God had given me to say, and then uh, all of a sudden, there was a, cha uh, there was a cross in the chapel. Over the cross were lights that if a generator tricked them, they went on. All of a sudden, the lights went on the cross, and then the phone rang. And they said that Carla had been executed. And there are still women in prison today that when I go in, they say, I was in the chapel with you when the lights went on the cross. Oh. It was like God knew our hearts were broken. And he just wanted us to know he was in charge. And, um, and she went right into the presence of the Lord. Thanks for sharing what you mentioned here about, you know, Carla and just you know, the, the night of the execution. You had mentioned... Um, or I think at another point in time, you and I had talked about Carla. And at that time, I think you mentioned that Carla had written many things while she was there on death row. And she had written many, many, many things, um, Bible studies and curriculums. Can you share with us how your ministry, Discipleship Unlimited, has been able to use that? Yes. Today we have faith-based storms. And the ones that <clears throat> Discipleship Unlimited have for women have a lot of the input that Carla gave me. Um, one of the things she talked about was a family uh, program where women would learn how to be moms. And then a recovery track. Out, so many of our women are addicted to drugs. 
Uh, when Carla committed her crime, she was high on drugs, had been high for four days. And, and so you have people going out and doing crazy things. They need to work a program. They need to understand that God has a plan and a way for us to, to get free from drugs and alcohol, to get free from addictions. And then we have spiritual. Of course, all of the th material that we do in a faith-based storm is Christ-centered, and it's all biblically based because the Bible can tell us how to do anything from finance to raising our children to forgiveness to our relationship with our mother-in-law. You know, it's just all in there. And so we have started doing that. We started with the first one at, in Central Texas for women. It was at the Murray Unit, and it started 12 years ago. And, uh, and we've kept track of the women. Uh, we have less than 2% rate of recidivism for our women. It's just been, and and what it's done for me is it's validated that the word of God works. If God says it in his word, we do it and it works. And he gives us power to do it. And he gives us a plan to do it. And not only have the women been changed, but we have right now 250 volunteers locally. And they go in and their lives are changed because they're introduced to a whole new uh, set of issues that they've never had to address before. They start praying. They start seeing God meet these needs of women that they can't meet because they're, they're limited. We're limited. We can't give them money. But God brings these uh, just miraculous things in, in view for all of us to see. He said, you just come. Let me take care of the rest. It's all covered. <laughs> and so it's been great. That's a, an amazing testimony of how God has worked through Discipleship Unlimited. Uh, I know that some studies show that the average rate of recidivism in prison is 60%. Uh, but just to hear what you had shared just a few moments ago, that Discipleship Unlimited's rate is 2%. I mean, that's just incredible. And I think really bears witness to the power of God's hand at work, even in prison. Uh, for those that are listening that may have a loved one uh, that's currently incarcerated, what advice would you give them? Well, I would suggest that you really pray, but also perhaps you need to consider going to celebrate recovery. Um, that's for people with hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Anybody who has a loved one that's in prison has been hurt really bad. We can become enablers, which is what I was for so long with my son, where I just enabled him to use drugs because I felt responsible. And one of the things about um, Celebrate Recovery, it's a Christ-centered program, so people in Celebrate Recovery will pray with you. Also, when they get out of prison, it's like you have to walk together with them but also that you have some good people in your lives that you can turn to as mentors and be patient. You know, the older I get, the more I realize my desperate need of Christ every single day because we just don't know what the right thing to do or say is. And he covers even when we say the wrong stuff because <clears throat> nobody gets it all right. But just to know his love and to share his love with those that are incarcerated. I mean, God will God will give you the strength to do that, and he will give you the wisdom. And the older I get, too, the more I realize every one of these cases is so different. But when people have surrendered and gotten on their face before the Lord and said, I don't have a clue how to do this, he doesn't. He never lets us down. It's kind of like when I was on my knees saying, if you're not real God, I'm not going to make it in this world. And he just showed up with his love. And uh, he's, it's a great adventure when you let it go. Just let it go. Yeah. Follow him. Well, Linda, I just want to thank you so much for just you know taking this time out of your day, driving all the way down from Gatesville to here in Austin and to just to share this story of like God working through your life. You know what started at such like a uh, almost like a hor horrific yes. you know beginning and just something that someone would have fast tracked you to go to prison right I mean right. Uh, right. I mean you're a, we're a prime candidate almost sounds like but that how God then worked through your life through your circumstances 
um, and then, you know, work through Terry's life, all connected to, like, you know, um, your ministry here in the prisons and with Carla Faye Tucker. Um, let me ask you this. For those that are listening, if they want to get involved with a ministry like yours, uh, or to learn more about your specific ministry, what where, where can they go? Well, you can visit our website at discipleshipunlimited.org. Um, there are many prison ministries. Prison Fellowship is all over the United States. Um, we are basically a Texas-based ministry now, uh, but there are ministries and ways. Kairos is one. Alpha is another. There's wonderful prison ministries. Uh, and pray for those in prison. The Bible tells us to pray for those that are in prison. And that's really that's really important. All right. Well, thank you so much. You've been listening to Linda Strom on Compelled, and we're glad to have you here with us. Thank you. Thank you. It's my joy. What an incredible story of God at work. Prison is probably one of the last places we'd expect to see God, especially on death row. But there he is, changing people's lives through the unlikeliest of witnesses. I hope you were as encouraged by Linda's story as I was. You can learn more about her ministry at discipleshipunlimited.org. If you enjoyed the story, then I've got some great news. We've got more! Like I mentioned earlier, this is the first week of our podcast. Normally, we'll release episodes every Tuesday, but for this week only, we're releasing three episodes all at once. This season, you'll hear from a former abortion clinic owner whose life was radically turned upside down by Jesus. And you'll hear from a two-time NFL Super Bowl champion who discovered that true victory wasn't found on the field. And in just a minute, we'll play you a sneak peek of our next episode. You can find all of our episodes, links to Linda's book and ministry, and more at our website, compelledpodcast.com. You can also find our episodes by subscribing to Compelled on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, or Pocket Cast. If you enjoyed our show, then we'd super appreciate it if you'd leave us a review and a five-star rating on iTunes. Also, consider sharing this episode with others that would be blessed by Linda's story. Our show was edited by Zach Fowler, who is a gifted film editor, visual effects artist, and storyteller. You can find Zach and his work at ZachFowlerImagery.com. Our logo was designed by Josiah Jost, an incredibly talented logo designer. You can reach Josiah and view his work at SiahDesign.com. Our website was created by Ben Billups, a digital developer extraordinaire. You can follow Ben on Instagram at Ben.Billups. Special thanks to my wife, Sarah Hastings, for helping make this project a reality. Without her, this podcast wouldn't exist. And that's it for this episode. Stick around after the music for a sneak peek at our next episode. I'm your host, Paul Hastings, and you've been listening to Compelled. We'll see you next time. So along the way, God just started changing my affections. And so I remember distinctly being at the bar one night, um, had my arm around, you know, some other girl and had, you know, a whiskey in my hand or something like that. And thinking about the the difference between the night before I was at this Bible study where I'm like praying and being this religious guy. And then night, you know, the next night I'm party guy, totally different guys. And then I realized the duplicity of my life that I was really living two different lives and being two different people and really being a hypocrite in both contexts at this point.